Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the webinar on investment law reform, The View from Asia. I am pleased to open the third session of our four-day webinar. The PowerPoint presentations and the recordings of sessions one and two are now available on the CIL website. The moderator for today's session is Professor Janssen Kalamita. He is the head of investment law and policy at CIL. So, Without further delay, we will now begin the webinar. Over to you, Janssen. Thank you, Stephanie. And welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. As Stephanie said, today is the third in our series on Asia and the reform of the international regime for investment. And the theme of today's session is investment treaty reform in Asia, rule takers, makers, or breakers. The panel today proceeds from the observation that in the first decades of the 21st century, we've seen Asia emerge as a global hub for the creation of international economic agreements. From the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, and the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, to China's wide-ranging Belt and Road Initiative, to the recent China-EU Comprehensive Agreements on Investment. Increasingly, larger and larger amounts of the global economy are being governed by agreements based in Asia. Now, the goal of our panel is to gain insight into the nature of these developments, broadly asking whether they represent instances of rule taking, rule making, or rule breaking by Asian states. And more specifically, are they rule taking in the sense that we see states in Asia adopting existing paradigms and rules of the international investment treaty regime in their approaches to international investment. For example, maintaining the existing model of investor protection and ISDS, or adopting treaty language developed outside of Asia, often in North America or Europe. Or do these developments suggest that Asian states are becoming rule makers in the sense that they are developing their own refinements and modifications to the norms and approaches of the investment treaty regime? In other words, making rules for Asian states in Asia, or even seeking to make rules of global application. Or finally, do we see evidence in these developments of Asian states being willing to act as rule breakers, not necessarily in a legal sense of breach of obligation, but more in the sense of rejecting existing paradigms for the regulation, promotion, and protection of investment. Well, our panel will begin with brief overviews of regional and country-specific developments by our four eminently qualified speakers. We'll begin with Dr. Stephanie Schacher, who will discuss aspects of the regional arrangements being developed in Asia, such as CPTPP and RCEP. Stephanie is my colleague at the Center for International Law. She's a postdoctoral fellow. She holds joint degrees from the universities of Geneva and Vienna. She's the author of numerous publications on sustainable development and international investment law. And her monograph on sustainable development in EU foreign investment law is forthcoming later this year from Brill. Her current work at the center examines the governance implications of regulatory cooperation and coherence commitments under preferential trade agreements with a particular focus on mega regionals. So she's obviously the right person for us to be listening to. Our second speaker will be Heng Wang, who will talk about China's developing approach to international investment, particularly with regard to traditional investment treaties, the Belt and Road Initiative, and the WTO Investment Facilitation Framework. Heng Wang is Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales, where he's also the co-director of the university's Herbert Smith Freehills Center on China International Business and Economic Law, the largest center of its kind outside of China. Heng's research focus on law and technology, Chinese law, and international economic development, particularly the Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese-US relations, and free trade agreements. He's published widely and extensively on international law in both English and Chinese, and sits on the executive boards of numerous societies on international law. Welcome, Heng. 
Following Hang, we'll hear from Prabhash Ranjan about India's approach to international investment agreements. For example, India's uneasy relationship with investment treaties and ISDS, as well as its involvement or lack of involvement in both RCEP and the WTO investment facilitation negotiations. Prabhash Ranjan is professor at the University of South Asia in New Delhi. He's a prolific author on India's international economic policy, particularly with respect to foreign investment, both in academic publications and the Indian press. His 2019 monograph, India and Bilateral Investment Treaties, Refusal, Acceptance and Backlash, was published by Ox Oxford University Press and is the leading resource on Indian investment treaties in the field. Welcome, Prabash. We're lucky to have you with us today. And then finally, we'll conclude our introductory presentations by hearing from Dr. Charlie Garnjana Gunchon on the perspective of Thailand as a mid-sized economy navigating large regional developments through its participation in ASEAN, through its own ongoing bilateral negotiations, and through its involvement at the international level in the reform efforts of UNCITRAL and ICSID. Charlie is Deputy Counsel General at the Royal Thai Consulate General in Sydney, Australia. Charlie holds a PhD in law from University College London. He began his career in the Thai MFA, overseeing Thailand's treaty-making processes before moving to Thailand's permanent mission to the United Nations in Geneva. He's played a key role in several international disputes involving the Thai government, in addition to providing legal advice related to international trade, investment treaties, and ISDS reform. Now, once we've heard from all of our panelists and their opening remarks, we'll open things up for discussion among our speakers and take questions from you, our audience. So please do go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A function as we go along. Definitely enough talking from me. So let's get things started by hearing from Stephanie Shacker. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Jensen, for the introduction. It's really a great pleasure that we do have this uh, conference ongoing and to sit on such a distinguished panel. Um, yeah, I will share a bit on the regional perspective. And I think I want to uh, jump back on something that is obvious and has been mentioned yesterday is that Asia as the new hub for trade and investment is, is pretty much clear if we show on the numbers of FDI inflows in particular now also Asia and more and more um, having FDI outflows. So I think for us international investment lawyers, it's really interesting to ask this question whether the economic importance of Asia uh, consequentially translate into investment law making uh, by Asian states or something that we can call it Asianization of international investment law. So in the 10 minutes that I have, I will try to capture some of the features of investment lawmaking in Asia. And um, one part is on the recent uh, regional trade and investment treaties. I will then move on to some comments on more detailed provisions found in Asian EIAs. And finally, um, make a comment on how Asian states engage with uh, certain substantive reform questions and new paradigms and trends. So now first, what do we have in terms of regional treaties? Obviously we have the main grouping, which is ASEAN having a new, relatively new investment agreement since 2019, ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, the ACIA. Um, next to ACIA, ASEAN has a number of ASEAN plus one agreements relevant for trade and investment. Uh, there is ASEAN China free trade area, which is based on a range of agreements between China and ASEAN, and it includes an investment agreement dating back to 2009. Um, ASEAN signed also these ASEAN plus one agreements with Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand together, India and Hong Kong. Now in 2011 on the ASEAN summit, the idea for a regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement, the RCEP was born. Um, and this, the idea was really to consolidate um, these, these many ASEAN plus one um, uh, treaties. After eight years of negotiations, we had the text finalized in November last year, very much with the push, push from China, obviously, which is also part of the RCEP. 
so it's 15 uh, contracting parties, uh, all ASEAN states and um, the ASEAN plus one trading partners. Now, RCEP is a truly mega regional agreement. It is to date the world's largest trade and investment agreement, compromising um, almost 30% of global GDP and one third of the world population. And these numbers, even though India stepped out of the negotiations in 2019. So far, RCEP has not yet entered into force. Now, the second mega regional in the Asia Pacific region is, of course, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans Pacific Partnership. This agreement was initially concluded in 2016 as TPP under the leadership of the United States. However, the Trump administration decided to step out of the agreement, but the remaining parties decided to go ahead. So it's the TPP-11 or also called the CPTPP. This agreement entered into force at the end of 2018. And even without the participation of the United States, I think we can still speak of a mega regional. It covers around 13% of global GDP and involves the livelihoods of 500 million people. So different than RCEP, uh, the CPTPP is not an Asian initiative in itself. It's a United States, mainly the Obama administration at the time. And there was the foreign policy called Pivot to Asia, uh, under which um, the TPP at the time was very much uh, pushed for. So from a legal point of view, and I, we will get back to this, CPTPP is following American treaty practice, despite the US no longer being a party. And I would like to share very briefly um, a graph to, um, to highlight this, this, this overlap uh, and the regionalization in the Asia Pacific um, region. So we do have in the middle, as you can see, ASEAN, the 10 member states of ASEAN. Uh, it's ASEAN plus one treaty partners pretty much in the circle around uh, the tiny ASEAN um, circle. And then in the top, we have the, the countries that are in the, in the TPP 11. Uh, so on the other side of the Pacific, there is Canada, Chile, Mexico, and Peru. Um, and you can see here the overlap with the RCEP. There are namely seven countries that are parties to both mega regionals. You can see them here. It's Australia, Japan, New Zealand. And then from ASEAN, it's Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam that have so far um, signed both. So now on this graph, they are warned, of course, the bilateral and there wasn't any mention of Europe. Now, what about Europe? So the European Union has as well a huge interest in the Asian market and the region. There is an, a long-term intention to have a free trade agreement with ASEAN, but so far this has not been um, finalized. The EU has managed to conclude a number of bilateral um, agreements with Asian countries. So Singapore and Vietnam, uh, we have trade and investment. Then we do have a trade, more trade uh, agreement with Korea and Japan. There are, however, uh, investment liberalization provisions in the treaty. And then um, the most recent one um, and a significant treaty is uh, the EU-China uh, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the CHI, uh, which breaks some new grounds as well. Uh, if we look at it, um, it's a bit of Swiss January structure that we have here, no investment protection, but investment liberalization. Just to conclude on Europe, um, beyond the European Union, there are also the EFTA states. So these are uh, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway and, Norway and Iceland. This grouping of country also has recently concluded a comprehensive trade and investment agreement with Indonesia. So you see there's also an interest uh, definitely in Asia. And we have the United Kingdom getting ready for bilateral treaty negotiation and has submitted formal request to become a party to the CPTPP. Now, when I go now a bit more in the micro uh, legal level and look a bit more closely on the, on the provisions and um, 
and we take RCEP as a proxy for Asian investment law making, um, it's, it's difficult to, to distill something that could be an Asian approach. And the reason is, I would argue that Asian state have taken over a lot of the typical investment uh, protection provisions, namely that are often called the gold standard of investment law making. So for example, if we look at um, the FET clause of fair and equitable treatment, uh, expropriation uh, with, uh, with the codification of the police power with the specification in an annex, um, if we look at non-discrimination, all these provisions look in RCEP, in ASEAN plus one agreements and in the CPTPP, not much different. So, um, there is more convergence, uh, I would say, than, 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 than a huge uh, difference to this agreement. Now, the, the, the big detail, and I'm sure many of you know this, RCEP does so far not have an ISDS, and this gives, of course, a different weight to investment protection standards. If you do have ISDS or not, CP, TPP has it, RCEP does not. However, this being said, I try to look at some features that are Asian. And again, I take RCEP as a proxy. And I would argue that if we look closely at how the definition of an investment is drafted in an Asian EIA, we can see that oftentimes we have the reference to a covered investment is qualified as covered if it has been admitted by the host state according to its laws, regulations and policies. This is Asian specific because many Asian states have rather restrictive legal frameworks, often requiring foreign investors to obtain written permission to enter the country in the first place. And this is, for instance, Thailand. Now, still on the definition, Asian EIAs um, have, when we look closely at how an enterprise is defined, we would also find that it is specified that an enterprise can also be governmentally owned. This is not in CPTPG, but RCEP specifies in the judicial person um, definition more precisely that it can also be governmentally owned. So there is, a, there is a, um, an awareness of, of state-owned enterprises. And lastly, uh, this is very much coming from ASEAN, um, is a particular attention given to developing country and least developing countries. So always this statement that the commitments that are taken by, the, by, by these uh, countries are understood in accordance with the individual, individual stage of development in a given country. Um, this has been included in RCEP um, and we find it in other ASEAN plus one agreements. And this can materialize then later on also in technical assistance and capacity building for these countries to actually effectively implement the EIA in question. Now, let me turn to the third point, which is how Asian states now engage with what is actually discussed, which are the hot debates at, at the international level on the reform. Um, and I listened, listened very carefully to Hamad El Khadi on Monday, and he said that Asian states do um, incorporate or engage with the reform approach of refinement, refinement of the rules. And this is certainly, and this is no doubt, I would say that again, RCEP uh, is an excellent example of very refined treaty provisions. Uh, you find, um, just to give you one example, in the non-discrimination clause, we have these footnotes now specifying in the footnotes what we understand uh, of like circumstances. So this is something that, that at least in RCEP, and we take this again as a proxy, um, is, is, is having. So yes, uh, refinement is something um, that, that Asian states um, participate. Now, the second point, where I think is a bit ambivalent is the integration of sustainable development. Okay? So this is um, difficult and ambivalent in the sense that I find sustainable development integration in Asian treaties when they are concluded in a bilateral setting. So you find uh, sustainable development in all the EU 
bilateral agreements of Asian countries. You find you find it in CPTPT, which was um, you know suggested by the, the by the US to have an environmental and labor chapter to have a specific reference to corporate social responsibility in the investment chapter in CPTPP, and. When we look at RCEP, there is nothing. And this came for many as a huge deception. How can a treaty that is concluded or finalized in 2020 not have more on, on, on sustainable development issues? So that's where I see a bit of a not fully fledged commitment to a sustainable uh, development. And then of course, I just might mentioned India uh, with its model BIT of 2015, a um, big integrator, I would say, of sustainable development. Lastly, I'm coming to, to the end, um, Asian EIAs strengthen also new trends. And I would say there is this trend of having more investment facilitation in EIAs, and Asian EIAs do um, participate and contribute to that. So RCEP has an investment facilitation provision, um, and also the CHI, so the China-EU Investment Agreement, is actually a treaty that is a hidden investment facilitation agreement because there are a lot of provisions on transparency and facilitating the establishment of European uh, investors in China. So um, here we have a big push in this trend. And China, since it shifted from a capital um, imported to a capital exporter, I would also say uh, that the CHI and uh, China having IAs is pushing or strengthening the trend of the inclusion of more investment liberalization provisions in IIDs. Right, so to sum up, um, of course, no clear cut answer. Well, this is really a, a brief overview um, of some of the aspects. I, I don't really see rule making. Um, yesterday, uh, Natalie from uh, the Singapore uh, government said that ASEAN is a global actor or a, you know, a rule maker in a sense. And I think it depends on how we see it. If we say rule makers is a, uh, is a country or a region that is able to make big deals, ASEAN qualifies as such. But if we look more closely on what they suggest on, on provisions and rule as a, in terms of, 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 of drafting of the provision, I would not say that ASEAN is a rule uh, maker. And then just to, um, yeah, to conclude and give the floor back to, to Janssen, I think there are two factors which makes it really difficult for as, uh, um, Asian countries actually to be um, a rule maker. And this is, and this is um, to have, obviously we have said that before, they are so different, we have capital exporters now and capital importers. So there is a huge economic variety between the countries. But I, what I think is interesting also is that the, the traditional rule makers, North America and Europe, they have a huge interest in this region. And I, and I would argue that these two uh, global actors, they really want their rules um, to be applicable in the Asian uh, region, right? And um, that makes it also arguably a bit difficult for Asia to have um, their own take. So with this, and I hope, and I look forward to a great discussion. Uh, back to you, Janssen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thanks for laying out the landscape of, of regional agreements uh, in Asia so, so comprehensively and thoroughly. Um, I think one question that we may want to pick up in our, in our discussion is um, the variety of approaches that we see um, by individual Asian states um, in these, in their treaty making. Um, as you pointed out, there's quite a lot of overlap between some of these treaties, and yet the approaches taken in RCEP and CPTPP are in many ways quite different, but yet we find the same states agreeing to both uh, sets of, of rules. So perhaps that's something we can talk about in our discussion. Um, Heng, let me turn things over to you for, uh, for China. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, yes, and also I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, it's been a great privilege to join this panel. Um, so what I would like to talk about is the um, investment law and uh, practice, particularly from Chinese perspective. Um, what I would like to ask is that, you know, whether we see that back into the uh, question of the rule maker or shaker or, you know, 
whatever role they have in that regard, whether we can see China has adopted a certain identifiable approach to international investment, um, you know, not only regarding traditional IAAs investment agreements, but also, uh, you know, WTO investment facilitation uh, framework, or more I would focus on today is about the Belt and Road Initiative, because I found it's been a pretty representative, you know, of China's latest uh, uh, practice. And secondly, uh, if time permits, I also want to explore briefly what's the, uh, the you know, how do we understand this approach, uh, particularly what are the influencing factors of China's approach. Um, so first, I think let's start with the international investment agreements, traditional ones. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, discussion about that, you know, so people may, you know, have a three generation or four generation of that. We understand that after China opened up in 1980s to 1990s, the first stage people may say that's being aware China gradually, you know, want to attract foreign investment and they take a quite, you know, conservative uh, investment uh, uh, agreements, you know, IAs. And, and then you see that in the second stage, if we have uh, out of the three stage, if you look at that, is then in 1990s to, you know, late 2000s, where you see that China, you know, at the time promotes, you know, um, you know not only attracting foreign investment, but also going abroad strategy. So you see that China has been shifting more towards, you know, conditional national treatment or later more substantial national treatment for dispute settlements. They provided for full access to ISDS, investor state dispute settlement. Um, and they're moving towards more liberal uh, uh, agreements, but still China is a uh, uh, net capital importer. And the third stage, we see that, you know, China moved from late 2000 to nowadays a more, you know, liberal approach because that China, as mentioned by Stephanie, that China promotes export of uh, Chinese investment, particularly under BRI, uh, particularly before the COVID and also particularly before the uh, US-China trade war, um, where you see that China, people may argue that China taken a kind of the uh, you know, laftization of China's IAAs. And the most recent one, uh, as mentioned earlier by Stephanie, has been, um, uh, you know, China, you know, although suspended the negotiation with US, uh, reached agreements with EU, uh, where they have uh, more uh, rules on transparency and, and also about leveling the play field, prohibition of forced technology uh, transfers and so on and so forth. So they seem to have more, you know, those kind of the social issues involved in China's uh, in investment agreements, but that's, it's largely affected by the negotiating power party. You know, that's a unique for, uh, you know, EU China investment treaty because EU has a negotiating power, not comparable with other contexts. Even if, if you compare with some other developed country, China has concluded with uh, IAs, it's not comparable with the EU China one. Of course, we see that, you know, US China negotiation was suspended. But also for the U.S. sorry EU-China investment treaty is due to the China-EU uh, relations dynamics. It has been postponed in terms of their uh, process of the discussion for these um, next steps. Um, so to wrap up here for IAs, I would see that China largely follow you know our Western practices uh, instead of building a very China unique uh, investment agreement uh, rules um, for the WTO. I would understand that, you know, for WT, we're, you know, China has been trying to, what I call, synactive reshaping, you know, in the sense that China take initiative, you know, to establish, you know, the friends of the investment facilitation at the WTO, and also promotes, uh, along with BRIC countries, of outlines for BRICS investment facilitation. So you see that actually, uh, it won't be easy because WT is such, a, you know, over 160 members. But China trying to uh, prioritize synactive area like investment facilitation because that works for China's interest, uh, and and also more important I would see is about BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, as you know that China has a I would classify into you know BRI a primary agreements like MOUs and second agreements like performance agreements. If we look at that, you see that they have a legalization. You know, which is China's a very low or minimal legalization in MOUs. You know, you don't see very strict rules or enforcement. And secondly, the feature of that is about project-based nature. 
So you know it's coordinated, but they are centered around you know project instead of investment protection and so on and so forth. And certainly you see a hub and spoke network. You know China as a as the center of all this kind of network of MOUs. I will see that very importantly. You'll see that China's approach is that they rely heavily on project agreements, you know, project contracts. Although it's difficult to analyze that because many of them are not publicly available, even MOUs. Uh, but they play a crucial role because then you could have a binding effect on the other party in terms of finance, dispute settlement, uh, investment protection, and so on and so forth. So these are quite unique and different from the traditional IAS we see. So if you see that China's identified approach, I think these are probably one special one China using uh, centered on BRI primary agreements and like MOUs and implemented by a strong network you know, of project, numerous projects uh, on investment uh, projects and including finance and other ones. And of course, they face a lot of challenges in this regard, you know, ranging from you know, lack of rule consistency or ambiguity or balance or possible tension of different factors like you know, uh, protection or preference over Chinese uh, investors. And then I would like to see that um, to, to jump that to, you know, to the next issue about how do we understand China's approach. Uh, I will see that China's approach to investment and also uh, BRI will be what I call maximize the flexibility. So you see that MOUs, you know, China has regarding investment, investment projects, contracts, or those investment facilitation, uh, friends, uh, whatever uh, measures China has taken, you see this varies a lot depending on the context, partners, and venues. Um, and also that happened also to dispute settlements, you know, and also to finance and, and other areas. And it may be explained that China won't have those maximized flexibility to enable trying to arrow, but you have challenges like predictability, coherence, and transparency. And that also may affect the promotion of uh, investment under PRI. So it's, it's future remain to be seen. Uh, and thirdly, the third aspect I would like to talk about is what is China's paradigm shift to investment, but also broadly international economic governance. Um, I will see that you know if we look at say uh, uh, Professor Peterman Porter's uh, uh, very useful and, and influential synactive adaptation approach that reflect China's you know a stage at accession to the WTO, where China downloads you know external norms. Uh, you know, particularly under the B, uh, the WT accession and adapt them to Chinese context, mm -hmm. but but you see a quite different one in the BRI and also more recent one, because China seemed to you know instead of downloading but changed to kind of uploading, you know, China's practice, uh, China style institutions, you know, like the Asia Investment, uh, sorry, AIB and so on and so forth. In that regard, it shows that you know China trying to selectively reshape you know, institutions and rules. And that happens, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the investment area, you know, in terms of, you know, China style MOUs, you know, and, and also um, China's, uh, you know, style investment agreements because China has been a pretty good negotiation position as the founding provider compared with other sides. Um, and also I would like to see that uh, uh, these are, involves institutions, uh, rules, you know, rules here, binding and non-binding ones, and also covers many areas, including, you know, WTO uh, and also other air context. And then you have the question, for synactive reshaping, what are the influencing factors? I will see that they are, they are quite different from synactive adaptation, um, um, even if some of them, the names seem similar. Of course, you have the why is the perception and conception. How do you understand you know, perceive the Western rules where China redo that, you know, and change that. And WTO, oh, sorry, in, in investment facilitation or outside in BRI investment, China want to tell China story. So that is only about perceive, but also conceive China's approach. And the secondly is a complementarity. Complementarity here means that how China's practice complement choice China's practice in that regard. So China's preference is that regard, including how China respond to the dynamics, you know, like the US-China trade war, or the, you know, um, the concern about China's rise and so on and so forth, or China's interest to promote outbound investment, and certainly legitimacy. That includes issue like, you know, how particularly about, in the past about domestic legitimacy, yeah, downloading WTO rules. But now in the BRI, it's more about international legitimacy. 
that is about how Chinese practice will be received and accepted overseas, you know. Uh, so that's the reason why BRI has been all referred to the United Nations General Council agreements and so on and so forth. So what I would like to conclude by saying that the synactic reshaping of China's approach is like to transform institution and rules incrementally, you know, particularly not, not necessarily for IAs, but from the practices, you know, and also range from new areas like digital currency, you know, which can work along with investment, you know, data, you know, as those new areas, and they carry long-term implications. And there are a lot of factors to affect the future, COVID, you know, slow down BRI and geopolitical uh, dynamics also makes more uh, uh, roadblocks for, for China's uh, pro practice in international investment. So to that regard, China synactic reshape norms, you know, in a special way, but there are a lot of uncertainties in that regard. So I'd like to uh, conclude here and return the floor to Jensen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Hank, um, for that framework, really, for understanding um, the different approaches that China has been taking uh, in different areas uh, with respect to in investment policy. Um, I think one, one question I'd love to come back to when we get into our session is, um, is really how to understand the, the legal framework that China is using um, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this contractual MOU based approach and whether that is in a sense um, a kind of paradigm shifting um, away from investment protection, investment state dispute settlement and, and so forth, um, or at least in terms of emphasis. Um, let's turn now to Prabash Ranjan. Um, Prabash will tell us um, about developments with respect to India. Thanks Prabash. Thank you very much, Janssen. Good evening. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Center for International Law for this kind invitation. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be part of a panel organized by the National University of Singapore. It's an absolute honor for me to be part of this panel. Uh, now, since we are talking about uh, three aspects, rule taker, rule maker, and rule breaker in context of Asia and Asian states, uh, after hearing a detailed presentation on China, I'm going to talk about India and what India has been doing when it comes to investment uh, treaty rule making. Uh, but before I tell you about these three aspects vis-a-vis -vis India, a very quick uh, background so as to help you understand and appreciate the context uh, in which India has done what it has done in the last few years. Uh, India signed a large number of investment treaties beginning early 1990s. These were all old generation or first generation investment treaties, which had very vague, broad, substantive provisions. Uh, all went well till about 2011, when India lost the first BIT arbitral case uh, in a case known as White Industries versus India. Uh, and, and after losing this case, there were, there were a string of other defeats uh, which India suffered uh, uh, under different claims brought by different foreign investors. Uh, and all of this, all these arbitral setbacks, if I can say, uh, forced India to revisit its entire BIT program. Uh, and as part of this review process, which started in about 2013, 2014, uh, it culminated in the form of India adopting a new model bit in late 2015, early 2016. Uh, Post-2016, India has been trying to negotiate new investment treaties based on this model bit. Uh, it has succeeded in doing so with a few countries such as Belarus, Mozambique, Brazil. Although with Brazil, uh, the India-Brazil BIT is modeled more on the Brazilian model rather than on the Indian model. Uh, the other important thing that India did was to unilaterally terminate all its investment treaties. Uh, of course, with the, with the desire that it would uh, renegotiate or negotiate afresh all these investment treaties based on the new Indian model. Now, if you carefully study the Indian model bit, uh, you know, one can uh, uh, pull out examples of all the three themes that we are talking about. Uh, rule taker, rule maker and rule breaker. Uh, in the limited time that I have, I'll try to give you some examples of all the three. Uh, and let's first start with rule taker. Uh, of course, you know, when India was reviewing its BITs, 
uh, a popular sentiment was that India should completely do away with the ISDS mechanism uh, and it should either have state state arbitration or you know maybe some other model but not the ISDS mechanism uh, but if we look at the Indian model bit it, it, it clearly tells us that India has continued with the ISDS mechanism so on this front it has it has followed the practice that is being followed elsewhere although there is one important difference that India has conditioned its access to ISDS mechanism to, to a large number of conditions. So for example, the foreign investor has to exhaust local remedies for five years. Uh, and there are several other procedural requirements that the foreign investor has to satisfy before commencing international arbitration against the state. Uh, so while the, the access to ISDS is conditioned to a host of procedural conditions, uh, India does follow the ISDS mechanism. So on this front, it, it continues to be a rule taker. The other example which I can offer is again on the provision on expropriation. Uh, uh, so the new model bit that India has contains a very detailed provision on expropriation. Uh, and following uh, what we see in the US model bit and other bits, uh, it also tries to explain how do we determine uh, indirect expropriation. Uh, so on this front, again, it kind of borrows the, you know, or builds upon the model or refines the model, if you can say so, which uh, US and, 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 and Western Europe has already started to do. Uh, I'll now give you examples of where I believe that India has acted as a rule maker. And of course, you know, uh, uh, the footnote goes that, you know, some of these things may be present in other bits as well, but largely I think these are these are some innovations that India has done in its model bit uh, and has continued to carry it forward in the other bits that it has signed post the model. Uh, the first example here is in Article 32 of the Indian model bit, which talks about general exception clause. Uh, you know, as we know, the general exception clause basically empowers the host state to deviate from investment protection if it is necessary to meet other compelling non-investment objectives such as environment, public health, etc. Now, this is not a novel provision. This is a kind of provision that you would find in several other bits. But the, but the interesting innovation is in a footnote to Article 32. And what does this footnote say? This footnote actually tries to, tries to define what is the meaning of necessary. Now, this is very interesting because we know that in investment treaty arbitration, the interpretation of necessary in the non-precluded measures provision has attracted a lot of controversy uh, right from all the Argentina tribunals uh, and, 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 and several other cases. Uh, the interpretation of necessary has, has, has been a very, very challenging issue. Uh, and, and, and therefore, the Indian model bit, perhaps in order to avoid all those complexities and to give a greater clarity for the tribunal, uh, says that uh, in considering whether a measure is necessary, the tribunal shall take into account whether there were whether there was no less restrictive alternative measure reasonably available to a party. Now we all know about the less restrictive alternative test. Uh, it has been used in the in, in the WTO. It has been used at other forums as well. Uh, you know, investment treaty arbitration tribunals such as Continental Casualty also use this approach. Uh, but what I'm trying to highlight is the fact that this is something which is given in the text of the treaty uh, makes it interesting. And to the best of my knowledge. Uh, you will not find this kind of elaboration about necessary in other bits. So this I, 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 I sort of flagged as an example of a rule maker. Another example or the second example which I can offer is on the question of appointment of arbitrators. Uh, Article 19 of the Indian model bit basically uh, contains provisions in order to avoid conflict of interest in arbitral appointment. The objective obviously is to ensure independence and impartiality of arbitrators. Again, a very, uh, very controversial issue in investment treaty arbitration. Now, within Article 19, there is a very interesting provision which hasn't attracted the kind of attention that it should have. And this is Article 1910, which basically says that, uh, you know, which basically lists down the grounds on which there can be a justifiable doubt as regards an arbitrator's independence or impartiality. Now, what are these grounds? I don't have problem with most of the grounds which are mentioned there. But if you look at Article 1910H, it says that uh, if the arbitrator has publicly advocated a fixed position regarding an issue on the case that is being arbitrated, 
then it would mean that there is a justifiable doubt as to arbitrator's independence or impartiality. Now, uh, this basically means that if, say, an academic has written an article uh, saying that use of most favored nation provision to borrow beneficial treaty provisions from third country BITs is absolutely perfect, uh, uh, this person cannot become an arbitrator or this academic cannot become an arbitrator uh, if in that case MFN is going to be an issue on which there is going to be interpretation or which is, you know, which, which is uh, in front of the arbitral tribunal. Now, this, I think, is, uh, while this is an example of a rule maker, I'm not going into whether this is a good or a bad provision that we can discuss in, in a separate seminar. Uh, but this, again, I find as an as a, as a Indian treaty innovation, uh, which perhaps you will not find in other bits. Uh, very quickly, two more examples on the rule, uh, rule maker front, and this pertains to uh, the first one is on exclusion of taxation measures. So Article 2.42 of the Indian model bit says that the treaty does not apply to taxation measures at all. Uh, now, uh, in India, this has been a very uh, controversial issue, very touchy issue for the Indian state because India has lost two cases uh, where taxation measures were involved. Uh, and, and, and therefore, India is you know, trying to ensure that there is complete exclusion uh, about taxation measures and they are not part of the BIT framework. Likewise, the other important exclusion is for compulsory licenses and other IP related regulatory measures, uh, such as revocation or limitation of IP rights from the ambit of the BIT, provided that such issuance is consistent with the TRIPS agreement. Uh, now, in most of the investment treaties, you will find a provision such as this, but a provision such as this generally occurs as an exception to the expropriation provision or maybe as an exception to the MFN or the national treatment provision. In the Indian model bit and the subsequent bits that India has signed, this, uh, the, the, uh, this appears as, as an exclusion to the entire BIT, to the entire treaty. So, so in other words, if any country or if India were to enact a regulatory measure which, which, which limits the IP rights of the investor, the investor cannot bring a BIT claim uh, regarding that regulatory measure, either for expropriation or for any other substantive provision. Now, uh, coming to the rule breaker, is there any example where India can be called a rule breaker? And when I say rule breaker, of course, as Janssen said in his introductory remarks, rule breaker doesn't mean breaking the rule in the legal sense, but kind of, uh, you know, absence of a particular provision, for example. And I'll say that the most obvious example of a rule breaker in the Indian model bit and the subsequent bits that India has signed is the MFN provision. So there is no MFN provision in the Indian model bit. There is no MFN provision in the India Belarus, India Mozambique, uh, and other bits that India has signed post the model. Uh, no surprises for guessing that this is a direct outcome of the White Industries Award because the White Industries case uh, India lost that case largely on account of interpretation of the MFM provision. So this could be an example of a rule breaker uh, in that sense. Uh, before I conclude, two quick points, and this is on uh, you know uh, India's uh, at attitude towards RCEP uh, and India's attitude towards investment facilitation. We can we can talk about this is uh, talk about this in greater detail in the question answer session. But very quickly, I'd like to say that India negotiated or was part of the RCEP negotiations for a very long time. Uh, uh, but ultimately, India did not did not accept or did not uh, accede to the RCEP uh, treaty. Uh, and this was largely because, not because of investment issues, but this was largely because there was a belief in India that the Indian market would be flooded by cheap imports from, from Asian countries, especially from China. Uh, and, and, and of course, there was a very strong uh, domestic uh, protectionist lobby, which actually sort of put, put a lot of pressure on the government not to, uh, not to be part of RCEP. Uh, so when we talk about an Asian approach, whether there is a common Asian approach, you know, this obviously raises questions because if, if, if a country like India cannot be part of something like RCEP, which is largely Asian driven, uh, you know, one really doubts whether there is really an Asian approach towards towards international economic law in general. Uh, and, and, and lastly, uh, India's approach towards investment facilitation at the WTO, uh, India continues to be suspicious of investment facilitation negotiations at the WTO. 
Uh, this is largely because of the belief that, uh, you know, if you allow negotiations on investment facilitation, then they're just the first point uh, for, for negotiations on investment protection in the future. Uh, and historically speaking, if you look at, uh, you know, the debates in the WTO in 19, early 19, uh, late 1990s, I beg your pardon, uh, India steadfastly opposed multilateral agreement on investment in the WTO. So because of that background, India believes that investment facilitation is just the first step and ultimately it would lead to investment protection. Uh, and this is the reason why India continues to oppose investment facilitation negotiations at the WTO. So uh, India's attitude overall to conclude very quickly, uh, I'll say is a kind of uh, uh, borrows from what is happening in the rest of the world. There have been some innovations that India has tried to do. Uh, overall, I would say that there is a protectionist sentiment currently in India, which kind of looks at uh, international trade, especially with, with, with some suspicion. Uh, the barriers that have been enacted in India in the last few years uh, are, are, are quite profound. On the investment treaty front, uh, I think the real test would be that whether India would be able to convince countries such as US and EU on its model bit. Uh, if not, then perhaps India might have to revisit uh, some of the aspects of its of its model bit. So I'll stop here, and I'll we can we can we can take questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabash, for that uh, th that fascinating overview of of an analysis of um, India's approach, particularly in its uh, model treaty uh, making and. Um, how that fits within our framework of makers, breakers, and takers. Um, lots of questions to, to follow up with you um, at, at when we get into the discussion session. Uh, I won't flag them now. Let me turn things over to, uh, to Charlie, though, um, to talk to us about Thailand. Uh, thank you very much, Jansen. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, thanks to NUS and NYU for having me on again. Um, always a pleasure to be in this forum. Um, like all good government officials, I must have a caveat. The opinions uh, I express here are obviously my own. They're not the position of my government. Nothing I say is confidential. And they may, may be things in the discussion which I may not be at liberty to discuss. Right, now, um, thank you very much for the three panelists um, that uh, were before me. They actually paint a very good background for what I'm about to say. Uh, my presentation um, is this. I would like to give you guys an insight on the world of the, um, the in-house lawyer for the government and how, how we deal with investment reform and investment treaties. Um, you know, so it would be the typical view of the, like me, an officer, officer at the Department of Treaties and Legal Affairs, something like that, right? Now, a bit of background. Thailand, as you all know, is a medium-sized country. We take investment very seriously. Uh, and we do feel that, it, you know, a good investment regime does uh, have a direct impact on our IFDI and the economy. We are currently working on something new as far as investment treaty is concerned, we are revisiting, like very much like India and many countries, we are revisiting our, our BITs and our FTAs. At the moment, we have 39 BITs, many FTAs, one of the earlier ones we did bilaterally with many countries like uh, Japan and then off to Chile. And uh, recently, as, as uh, Stephanie has highlighted, um, more you know, ASEAN, ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus plus. Um, a bit more background, as far as ISCS cases are concerned, we've had three or four odd cases. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been part of two of those. Um, and just a little context, in the cases what we've lost, I think in very much in the same vein as India, um, we, we, when, you, when we get stung, it's made a big impression on, on government officials on how we think about things. So I think that's very important to, to take bear in mind. Now, the theme of my, what I'm going to say, it's, uh, it's down to two thrusts or two main, uh, three main points through our lens. The first, what I will do is I will highlight the concerns um, and, the, and the factors that uh, government officials take into consideration of late 
about investment reform. So the inside view. Um, and secondly, um, to address the question that um, Janssen has posed, you know, about makers, takers and breakers, right? Now, as for the background, um, for a medium-sized country like Thailand with, uh, and actually a reasonably large uh, legal service, international legal service, we still find that investment law, investment reform is a bit of a labyrinth. You know, um, when, when I joined the service and uh, when I started uh, doing investment law, I, I felt a bit like Alice in Wonderland going through the small door into the labyrinth and not knowing where, where to go. It's a bit like that. Well, why is that? As Romesh mentioned um, yesterday or the day before, we have so many treaties, you know, old and new, and so many counterparts, big and small, and so many processes, you know, of reform, of negotiation, exit, anxiety trial, and domestically, we have so many agencies. I mean, as, as you know, most measures that will uh, concern investment law at the international level, de deriving from a domestic level, will be measures from line agencies, which, you know, most commonly it will be petroleum or, or something like that, you know, or, or it will be uh, something that uh, is very quite specific in terms of domestic law. So at the... Um, as a government lawyer, we have to be aware of these very, very special legal regimes inside our own jurisdiction. So this is the framework at which we work with, right? Now, the, the second thing, going back now to, I will conclude first. So going to the question of makers, takers and breakers, my answer in, in my own perspective is the firm uh, yes and no. You know, the Asian perspective, are, are there makers, takers and breakers? Yes and no. And, and I will address the reasons why in a minute. And the second related question, which I found very interesting, yes, uh, the, the first day, the second day was, what's a, a general Asian approach? Uh, I think I, I, I do agree with uh, the Secretary General Vixit, that she said that there was no particular Asian approach. And what I found interesting, though, was what Natalie said yesterday about the ASEAN approach. I'm not quite sure I, I did agree with Ashley um, to the extent that there is an ASEAN approach. So I will stick with my yes and no again for the ASEAN approach, right? Um, so that's my preliminary remarks for the conclusions on, on those topics. Now, I, sorry, it's a bit of... So I will go into detail now on why I think for a... Uh, medium-sized office uh, legal service, uh, things are at the moment, they're at the crossroads, they are very confusing now. I've identified five issues which, we've, which have uh, been factors for us to consider at the foreign office. So number one is the shifting dynamics of the e economies of different countries. Second is the changing nature of the players themselves. The third is changing nature of FTAs. The fourth is the experience from various generations of FTAs that we've done in the past. And the fifth is the current reform efforts, right? So the first point about shifting dynamics of the economies between countries, you've seen that today um, with China and India, the Belt and Road Initiative, India moving away, moving away from ISCS, uh, the new model BITs, right? The, the economies and the relationships between countries is not quite what it used to be in the past. At least it's certainly not what it used to be when the first generation of BITs existed. Now, so we have to look at this through uh, two different lenses, you know, uh, one which we did uh, the first generation of agreements back, back in the day, and one which is today, you know, so, uh, for at least for our service, uh, we, we have to think very carefully. We look left and right, you know, what's, what's, what's the trend? What's China doing? What's India doing? You know, and, and where do we stand? I mean, we, we're certainly not, not large enough to take a, uh, a take it or leave it approach. So, so we have to, to tread very carefully in this regard. The second point, the changing nature of the players. There are many more players now in the investment world than before, right? Uh, many more countries are aware of the investments, right? 
the changing nature, more countries are, who were traditionally receivers of investment are now exporters of investment. Thailand is certainly one of them. So our position with regard to the negotiation of provisions of treaties, we have to also consider the policy considerations of um, the investment going out and coming in, right? Um, as, an, uh, as a block, ASEAN also is changing a lot. So also when we negotiate ASEAN plus ASEAN treaties, we also have to take that consideration. Now, the third point, changing nature of FTAs. As I mentioned before, uh, we have many generations of FTAs, all of them, I mean, they're, they're almost not recognizable as the same you know, type of agreements from, from the first ones to the current ones today. I mean, if you take what Stephanie was saying about RCEP, you know, and the first ones and the first ones that we did were not so many pages and RCEP is like, you know, a thousand pages, something like that, right? So uh, they're very, very different in terms of their nature. Um, and to, to, on another point, I'll say, on, the, on the same point, but from a different side of the coin, um, we, for, for the countries that uh, are like the likely candidates that we are going to achieve FTAs with, we, we've done BITs and FTAs with them. So, so you know, the, now the turf is expanding, right, to countries which are, could be arguably more, more, more difficult to strike agreement on, or we have to, more, uh, to negotiate on more difficult or challenging terms. So that's the changing nature of the FTAs. And um, once we go to the RCN plus agreements, now they're very unique because as, as uh, Natalie was mentioning yesterday, we do have an RCN position for those, right? But it is very difficult to, you know, RCN is, is 10 countries, right? And, you know, it's, it's not quite too many cooks for the broth, but too many cooks certainly makes the broth very complicated. You know, the, the, the Thai chef with Tom Yam doesn't quite agree with the Vietnamese pho or the Singaporean and Malaysian laksa chef. You know, so in order to get the RCS broth in the first place, it's quite a challenge in itself. And taking that to the Australian potato and leek soup chef is an even bigger challenge, right? So uh, with so many players, the, the landscape of the negotiation changes a lot, right? The next point which I'd like to address is the, I'm um, zipping through here, I'm so sorry, but many points I want to make. Um, the, the past experience with the various generations of FTAs. Now I mentioned earlier, Thailand itself has had three, four cases. Um, and you know, as many in-house lawyers will tell you, um, once you've been stung by, by a lawsuit, life's not quite the same, you know, like, uh, like Prabesh was saying, once, once you've, uh, because like all international law cases, these ISD case, ISD, ISDS cases are a very important politically, you know, and back in the days of the first generation agreements where we've never had cases, life is, you know, it's, it's rosier than it is today. You know, and once you've had a few cases, you know, it's, you look through things through a different lens, right? So that is certainly a big factor, which uh, has an impact on whether there is an Asian maker, breaker, or taker perspective, right? The last point which I like, the last factor which I like to make, uh, which has an influence on the whole landscape of uh, our lens of investment reform is the current reform efforts. You know, over the past, I say five years or so, there's been a big boom um, in, in discussion on investment law, on reforms. You know, there have been, uh, there's obviously the reform at ICSID, at ANSITRAL. Uh, we've been active in, in most of them. And um, frankly speaking, it's quite difficult to navigate. Um, you've seen the agenda which Jensen brought up only at um, Working Group 3. Right. And that's just, you know, and for each agenda, we, we have to have a position and we have to check that with the exit position and with the other foreign positions, you know. So um, it's it's very challenging for us. 
So that's another factor which, which we have to consider in forming our positions on, on, on Thailand and negotiations on investment law. Now, with all those factors in mind, what does that mean for a medium-sized country like Thailand? Well, well frankly, uh, quite a big stack of papers on my desk, you know, and uh, you have to look very thoroughly at everything before you make any decisions. So, um, so things don't move as quickly as they perhaps used to. And we do an awful lot more consultations with agencies, with line agencies, uh, to see whether, you know, whether the new regime or the new way of doing things, maybe from, you know, uh, bigger players in the game, will it suit us? To, to, and to what extent will it suit us? Right? Right, now, going to my big second point on for Asia, rule makers, rule takers, or rule bakers, right? I said yes and no before, right? So yes, you know, as my as colleagues have mentioned here, there are some countries that you know, have, have the big might of being to say, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do this. Um, for the medium-sized and smaller countries, I'm not so sure whether we, we in that place, uh, we have to look at things a bit more carefully. Um, and no, in, in, in the respect that, um, you know, we ask Asia is a, such a diverse continent that there is no one single Asian approach, you know. So yes, you know, there's some things that, uh, Asian countries do. I know, you know, there's some things that we, we, we can't agree upon, right? Because uh, as, you, as mentioned, investment treaty uh, is a process essentially traditionally coming from, from Europe and, and United States. Um, in, in our view, um, the basic fundamentals are, are still the same. You know, so liberalization, protection, promotion, facilitation, they're still all there. But uh, lately there have been a lot of tweaking of those concepts in, in, uh, in the treaties. And those tweaks, we, we have to look at carefully whether we, we can hop on board or not. My last point on ASEAN, which uh, Jansen wanted to me, me to mention. Now, ASEAN is, is unique. Um, ASEAN, in many ways, it's a very integrated block, but in many ways, it's not. Right. I mean, as you know, ASEAN is a very diverse region, culturally, not economically. Uh, we are not like uh, the European Union. Uh, we are not in the block, in a block, in that sense. Um, in some ways, you know, we are many countries in ASEAN. We're still competing for investment. Um, so, you know, as the Thai saying goes, you know, whoever's got the longer hand gets gets the gets the product right you know so uh, it's still um, uh, you know it even though we are blocked we're, we're still competing in many ways so um it's you know it's a case of still what's to the to the benefit of 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 each each one right um so the result is this you know in in some negotiations we we do negotiate as a block um in in some others when differences maybe can't be ironed out, um, you know, we, we can't, right? So in, in some areas, there is an ASEAN position and, and some, like, like in uh, the negotiations of some ASEAN++ FTAs, um, in other fora like ANSI-TRAL and EXIT, um, there are not, you know, that ASEAN countries, because like I mentioned before, we are at different stages, like for example, at the ANSI-TRAL working group three, um, predictably, um, you know, countries like Singapore and Vietnam, who've got FTAs already with the EU, they are automatically more open to, to what they already agreed upon, right? I mean, that's, that's natural, right? And countries, other countries, which don't have that arrangement, they, they have to think a bit more carefully on, on, on where to go at, uh, as such fora. I'll stop there. My time's up, but I look forward to the discussion later.
Thank you very much, Charlie, for uh, for giving us that, that overview and actually that in-depth look of the challenges that are faced both by government lawyers, but particularly by medium-sized states in, in navigating a complex environment of reform. Um, there are so many directions that we could go because those have been really interesting uh, presentations and they raise a lot of questions. We have also quite a few questions in our Q&A box. So let me try to, let me ask a few questions of my own and try to um, integrate some of the questions that we've received from our audience. And just to the audience, um, please do continue uh, submitting questions um, as our discussion continues. There is time for us to address a, a good many of them. Um, I, I want to start where we began with, uh, with the regional agreements, um, and particularly RCEP and uh, CPTPP. Um, I mean, looking at these treaties, um, they are very different uh, treaties in many ways. Um, the U.S., of course, isn't a party to either of them, but it has its fingerprints all over CPTPP. And, and in many ways, CPTPP seems to be the more ambitious agreement um, in terms of its scope. Um, in keeping with U.S. practice, as Stephanie, you mentioned, um, there are chapters on environment and, and labor, but also on state-owned enterprises and transparency and, and corruption. And RCEP has none of that. Um, but yet there's an overlap in the membership between these two treaties. Um, as you mentioned, um, there are four, four countries, four ASEAN countries, which are parties to CPTPP, as well as to RCEP. And I guess with that, the question that raises for me, and for Stephanie perhaps first, but then, then Charlie and others, is, and I recognize Charlie's, uh, Thailand is not a member of CPTPP, but there has been discussion from time to time. Um, but do either of these positions reflect a preferred approach um, among at least ASEAN states? Um, or is ASEAN state participation in these agreements um, somehow reactive to what counterparties are proposing or, or submitting? Do you want me to start first? Yeah, yeah, and please. Yes, Sorry, yes, Stephanie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> please go oh, ahead. Sure. I mean, it's, 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 I think if we go back to the origins and the raison d'etre of this, of each of the two of the treaties, it's, it's, it's very different, right? Um, I was mentioning this, this summit in, in 2011, where ASEAN um, head of states discussed um, having um, an, a comprehensive agreement in order to consolidate. So the term consolidation came up a lot. Um, and then if we go back and look why CPTPP or TPP at the time uh, was, was initiated, and we look at what uh, President Obama said, and I found this very telling um, quote of him where he said, uh, and, and actually I have it in front of me because I found it so interesting, you know, he said, when more than 95% of our potential customers live outside of our borders, we can't let countries like China write the rules of the global economy. We should write those rules. So TPP uh, is from the origin something very much rule and norm promoting, a very legalistic uh, way. Um, um, and Professor Wang mentioned um, you know, this difference between having a legalistic approach to investment law or this project based. And I think the TPP is really this typical Western legalistic approach in coming with these concrete rules. And, and, and RCEP has a different origin. It's, a, it's, it's more, um, we know we want to consolidate what is already ongoing and therefore it's not so much the focus of having stringent rules and stringent enforcement, but more having something like a framework, um, getting these countries on, on the same and on the same table. Um, and I would say here the, the you know the origin, and that makes it today the difference in the treaties. Now, which one will be more successful or which one is more attractive um, in the future? 
very difficult because I think that there are there are benefits for some countries maybe to to, to join more or less a regional bloc that has uh, that has not so uh, stringent rules and then others uh, maybe more interested in actually having something very substantive, right? Um, so. Yeah, with this, I think I, I hand it over to, to Charlie because for me it's a bit difficult to see how, you know, because these four ASEAN countries that are effectively in, uh, TP, in our CPTPP, uh, what was, uh, what were they thinking or how did it came? Was it really because by invitation that they got, they got on the negotiating table? And I very much assume so, but I'm, but I'm, I'm very happy to hear Charlie's point on that. Thank you. And Charlie, before I pass things to you, I, I wonder just to pick up on Stephanie's point about ASEAN um, and the, the consolidating ambition uh, that, of RCEP. Um, one thing we notice about ASEAN treaties is, is their tendency to proliferate and to operate on multiple levels. So we have AKIA among the ASEAN member states, but then we have bilaterals between the member states. And then we have FTAs with the ASEAN plus countries and some member states have their own FTAs with these, with these member states. And now we have RCEP on top of it. Um, can there be an ASEAN position with so many ASEAN positions? Yeah, so I think you go back to how effective also is this whole consolidation. If you keep, keep ongoing all the, let's say the lower level, it's not lower level, but it's the it's the, it's the smaller circle of uh, uh, treaties, trade and investment treaties ongoing, right? How effective is the consolidation? If, is there an Asian position? So I, I don't think so much, no. It's, so far, it seems more like, um, yeah, like showing the ability of having such a big deal. Um, and and um, again, I think the ASEAN position, I think sometimes ASEAN maybe is even a bit undermining itself if it's not making the last step and then really also ending you know the bilaterals that are ongoing in the region so so all that makes it a bit um, less effective i would say and less leading to an asean position definitely is yeah. that's what happening charlie are you are is thailand undermining itself <laughs> you know that's that's a very interesting question and um, i think my, my take is this you know um what you have to consider is that these negotiations like stephanie says happens in different contexts and different times, right? So to go back to Jansen's question, is one better or a paradigm over the other? I, I don't think so. To the extent that the, you know, if you, if you imagine a negotiation table, right? I mean, different tables will have different people, different circumstances, they're pretty much different almost everything, right? I mean, the, the lawyers will be similar people, if, if they're still around for that time frame, right? But uh, all the other, the government probably different, the policy different. So, so that will have an impact on what is agreed in that uh, FTA, right? And I think what a lot of people forget is that the provisions that are agreed upon in each text are not always the ones that at least everyone is happy with, you know, I mean, in negotiations, there'll be a lot of arm twisting about, right? So, um, you know, so you, for some provisions, you would be forced, well, to, to accept something in exchange for other things, right? And um, this is, this is one, one, you know, one uh, rookie mistake that the juniors at, at uh, my department always make is that they assume that the, the, the text in front of them is the one that everyone is happy with, right? Which is which is not all, well, which is hardly the case, you know. So uh, that's that's um, so so you have to consider in that context is that if if no, not everyone is happy with that text, but it's the acceptable text. Maybe at a later negotiation, there is room to negotiate that they couldn't negotiate in the previous ne negotiation. If you see what I mean. Let, let me let me stay with uh, with the ASEAN for a moment because we have a couple of questions in in the Q and A, um, particularly about ASEAN and as it happens, um, ASEAN and its relationship with the Belt and Road Initiative as well. Um, 
but a couple of questions asking about um, the possibility of ASEAN states um, acting in a way that could put them in the position of being more rulemaking um, and perhaps building upon the common positions that ASEAN states develop in negotiating these FTAs, for example, um, and putting them forward as common positions in other fora. Um, Charlie, do you see any, any chance of that happening, any discussion of that happening? What's, what's holding back? Do you mean in the context of uh, substantive provisions in FTAs or in the context of uh, procedural reform in working group three and next year, that sort of thing? Either, really. Um, because, I mean, I know certainly in, in terms of UNCITRA, we've seen submissions from individual ASEAN states, Thailand, of course, um, Indonesia, Singapore, and so forth. One would imagine that it's somewhere in there, there is common ground on, on certain positions, be it um, allocation of costs or even these very technical matters. Yes, I, th I think that there is potential for a ASEAN position in but well, certainly in my eyes, certainly on the substantive provisions which ASEAN has agreed upon. But it goes back to what you were saying earlier. You know, don't forget that uh, with these FTAs, there is many multiple layers of agreements that are binding upon each state, right? And a lot of the time, the provisions are not the same, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so we have to navigate that very closely. and. And once you take a position that is different from what you've agreed upon in the past, be it an ASEAN position, you, you, you are answerable to, to why that's the case, right? So, uh, so it does, that does make it a bit of more of a challenge. That's what, for the substantive part uh, of the FTAs. Now, to the procedural reform part in, in Exit and, and uh, Working Group 3, um, I think there is also room for that, but um, to, in, in many ways, uh, the reforms on those fronts are less kind of pressing on, 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 the, on the staff in the sense that, um, you know, it's going to take a long time, you know, like uh, we were discussing earlier, you know, the discussion is still going on, you know, there is still room to uh, to talk about these things. So I don't think that the time is ripe yet in those contexts for there to be a, a definite ASEAN position, if that makes sense. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And Hang, to you, there was a question from one of our audience members about the impact of Belt and Road projects and by implication, Chinese involvement with um, Southeast Asian economies and the impact that that might have on the, the freedom of those countries to um, navigate uh, this process of, of rule creation and, and norm making um, that's going on internationally. Um, you mentioned that China, that international legitimacy is an important consideration for China in, in the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, I wonder if you could explain that insofar as it in, unlike in a treaty, it's not a particularly transparent process. As you mentioned, the, the contracts and the MOUs um, are not public documents. Is, this, uh, is there reason for skepticism, I guess, from, from countries entering into these agreements as to the effect they'll have on, on their economies and also on their governance? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh... Yes, and also thank the question. I found it really uh, useful and also very timely. I think uh, I, I understand that and also uh, in international legitimacy, um, you know, is a pretty uh, important and solid issue China faced. Uh, on one hand, you know, the BRI, um, you know, is a way where China promotes Chinese investment in, you know, infrastructure, which are critical one carry long-term distributive effects, you know, in the BRI countries, thinking about, you know, dam, you know, railway, airports, these are not really short-term ones, but long-term ones. And also they have a lot of issues involving that regard, you know, ranging from labor 
to indigenous group, you know, to the uh, uh, environment assessment, social impact. So, on one hand, I think China feels the need, you know, to prove that the BRI and the practice is legitimate. Um, so that's the reason why um, you see that China, uh, you know, proposed and, and, and this BRI has been referred to by United Nations, uh, you know, General Council documents, uh, resolution and so on and so forth um, to show that, and also China's BRI, uh, um, you know, documents involving those related to investments frequently referred to international standards. Another side, you see that there's a concern over that because what happened in practice, you know, um, so on one side, you can see that, you know, China may argue that this relates to, you know, AIB, where does it uh, relate to investment, you know, in finance relate to investment and more broadly, that current international financial system is problematic, hasn't really reflects the voice or the concerns of developing country. So that's not really uh, so legitimate in that regard where China want to promote a Chinese uh, uh, voice or plan, which uh, arguably from Chinese perspective solves this problem. But another side, you know, as I mentioned, many other issues like transparency or uh, insufficient engagement or different criteria in social impact assessments that you know makes it difficult to uh, or makes the international legitimacy may face a lot of challenges in that regard. So coming back to the question of the impact on the region, um, that means um, uh, there are likely legitimacy is likely the major challenge China will face going forward, because here is because you that we we at the end of the day depends on other countries' view on legitimacy of China's inactive reshaping efforts um, and that varies significantly from one country to another. So that would be more tricky, for example, if you look at post-COVID uh, era. So I think that will have a, a lot of impacts on China. And it's also being an uh, in interaction between China and other countries in that regard. China trying to make adjustments but other countries uh, may have their own response. So that's the reason why you see in the second Belt and Road Forum, China trying to see that low end is an issue, you know, high quality project will be important, while they also have concern about BRI countries, well, whether that is, uh, you know, it's the case in reality. So I will see there'll be more debates in that regard as a lot of uncertainty and challenges China will like to face. It's fascinating. And it, it it brings up the, the question that I was I, I raised at the end of your comments, which is the degree to which China is, is using the, the frameworks and the structures that it's developing in its BRI projects as a way to shift the paradigm of investor host state relations, in this case, Chinese investor host state relations away from the more mm -hmm. formal structures that we've seen in, in IIAs. Um, and I, in this, in connection with that, I want to raise a question that's been raised by Professor Alvarez, um, who asks, he says, Professor Wang, your, your thesis that China is engaged in selective reshaping of investment rules, as opposed to selective adaptation of WTO rules is fascinating. Can you provide a concrete example whereby China is changing not the texts of IIAs, uh, but how they apply in practice? Um, and then he adds, or have I misunderstood your thesis? Yeah. Um, again, I think this is a fantastic uh, question. Uh, I would like to see that um, what I would argue that China using uh, BRI primary agreements. Here I mean that you know, MOUs and, and the like at the primary agreements, and then they work together with project contracts. You know, those relates to finance and also project contract construction and so on and so forth. Uh, one example would be if you look at the primary agreements is what I said, you know, minimum uh, legalization. Um, so, for instance, you know, you, they have several aspects of that. A primary agreement has a low degree of obligation and weak obligatory force. You know, if you look at MOU, they say they are not binding. The provision usually hortatory, you know, endeavor to. Um, and, and, but, uh, you know, what happens is that, you know, in reality, you rely on uh, you know, projects, contracts, which is binding, uh, which are binding, which also involve issues like dispute settlement. And if you down the track to see that for dispute settlement, there are reports that, you know, the, some of them also use Chinese law as applicable law, you know, which has been quite different, uh, you know, in the past. 
uh, compare what's happened in the past. Um, so you see those kind of operations is a two tire system, you know, BRI primary agreements, which is looks, uh, uh, you know, quite low level of obligation, but you have more detailed, uh, much more detailed and binding contract enforced possibly through Chinese, uh, under Chinese law as applicable law. And also second, that primary agreements of Chinese BRI usually do not delegate legal authority or unlike, you know, existing soft law instruments if in the Western, um, you know, style uh, norms. So they don't have the characteristics like legal delegation. They don't have a third party adjudication for primary agreements. It's rely on consultation, you know, or very rarely also have the uh, mediation, but that's very exception only, I think, involve one United Nations agency. And certainly the primary agreements generally have a lower level of precision than existing soft law. So, you know, China has a preference of broad lease is better than concrete lease, you know, in that regard. They give a lot of room for China to, to how to implement and, and, and also shape the, the relations, you know, the project in, this, in the practice. So give a lot of room for that regard. Uh, and also uh, one example uh, we had in the past is the Victoria government of China's NDRC framework agreements, which has been canceled. But they originally say that, you know, they have a working group, you know, they will develop a, a joint, uh, you know, roadmap. But uh, another one is, uh, is the China New Zealand uh, MOA provides for more detailed work plan to be formulated with their timeline, you know, about 16 months. So you see those kind of things where, you know, it's basically not using ISDS, uh, you know, under IAS, but refer a lot of flexibility. And also, uh, and also implement through project contracts. Although we are limited in our observation, because many of them are not really public available. Yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating, um, and poses significant uh, research hurdles, un undoubtedly, because of the absence of publicly available uh, information. Nothing new, though, in investment law. Um, Prabash, there are a number of questions um, for you, um, and and. One that I had listening to your your discussion um, was you know, trying to understand the drivers of India's uh, reforms, particularly with respect to its um, its 2016 model. Um, obviously, reactive to India's experience in ISDS, and as you tracked for us with respect to MFN, clearly the white industries case. Um, left uh, left its mark with with that. To what degree was this though a the product of a of a focused review, um, or was it more politically driven, more ideologically driven? And and here let me let me add a, a question raised by Professor Alvarez in the chat. Um, he notes you you mentioned the impact of protectionism on India's posture. India is a significant FDI exporter. Is it true that those internal business interests were largely not consulted when India put out its 2016 model BIT? Did they think that the exhaustion and other procedural hurdles to ISDS imposed in the new model um, benefited them when reciprocally applied? Yeah, thank you, Janssen. Uh, and to answer your and Professor Alvarez's question, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the most important driver for the change in the investment treaty rulemaking that happened in India was the government itself. Uh, and the sole motive, since I have followed this very closely, uh, the sole motive was to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, India is able to shield itself against future claims brought by foreign investors, because these claims are seen as huge irritants by the government. You know, no government wants to pay out, you know, no government likes to lose, first of all, to a foreign investor. Sovereigns don't mind losing cases to sovereigns, but sovereigns do mind losing cases to private foreign investors. Uh, so, oh, and, and, and especially when you have to sort of pay damages, you know, which basically means you have to pay money to the investor. So the, the sole motive behind the entire review process was to ensure that no future claims can be brought, or at least to minimize the future claims. And that explains why India has a ISDS provision, which is conditioned to several procedural uh, hurdles. And as I have argued in my book, 
it makes it almost practically impossible for any foreign investor to make effective use of the ISDS provision of the kind that we have in the model bit. Uh, it might sound uh, bizarre to, to, to many of you, but the fact is that uh, there, was, there was not adequate consultations that happened during the review process. Uh, interestingly, the government did consult some international think tanks on reviewing the model, but it, it hardly consulted academics or researchers who are working in this area based in India uh, for reasons which I don't know. There were consultations uh, with the industry, uh, but again, uh, there are two things here. Firstly, I don't think the Indian industry is so well aware about investment treaties and the potential of making use of ISDS while it invests in Africa or in Latin America or in other Asian countries. So uh, many, many uh, private uh, uh, industry players in India lack an awareness about the utility of bits. Uh, and secondly, even if some of them uh, flag the concerns that this would be reciprocal in nature and therefore this would act against us as well when we try to make use of this uh, uh, overseas, uh, since the government was keen to ensure that there are you know, uh, uh, very few cases brought in the future, those, those concerns were brushed aside. So therefore, the reason why we have this, in my view, uh, the reason why we have this one-sided kind of approach to the investment treaty uh, is because it was largely driven by the government trying to ensure that future claims are not brought against India. Can I follow up on that with uh, another of, of a number of questions that have come in about India's model and uh, things that are in or, or not in the model? Um, I have a question regarding... Um, mediation and conciliation in India's treaties. Uh, question from Brian Chang. India's older bits contained numerous rulemaking, innovative provisions for UNCTRAL conciliation as an alternative to investor state arbitration, and even in a few cases as a precondition to arbitration. But the 2016 model does not mention conciliation or mediation in the ISDS provisions. Do you know why these forms of ADR were left out was it because of India's experience in the Vodafone dispute in which there were debates over whether the government of India could take part in conciliation without cabinet or parliamentary authorization and whether the conciliation should be at the national or international level? Yeah, thank you for that question. Frankly, I, I would not know the exact reason why provisions on mediation or you know, other ADR were left out in the Indian model bit. But I don't think this was because of the Vodafone case, because by the time the Vodafone case was brought and you know, by the time there was, there was action happening on that front, uh, there was already considerable work that had happened uh, in framing the model bit. So, this, so I can say that this wasn't because of the Vodafone case, but uh, I, I would not be able to you know, answer the exact reason why, uh, why you know, provisions on mediation and conciliation are missing. But yeah, this is a very interesting observation that India had this in its uh, previous bits, which, which have been now unilaterally terminated, but they, but they don't find a place in the model bit. Thank you. There's another question uh, again about India's model and, um, and the necessary, the necessity uh, provision that you were descri describing. Um, does the integration of less restrictive means test into interpretation of necessary um, mean, in your view, the importation of WTO jurisprudence um, on the interpretation of GATT Article 20? Um, yeah, it does indicate in that direction. I mean, as I've, as I've argued in, you know, in my writings that uh, uh, the fact that India provides for, you know, the fact that India indicates towards what could be the meaning of necessary, one thing is sure that it, it completely rejects the use of customary international law to interpret necessary, something that several uh, tribes, several Argentina tribunals did. Uh, and the reference to less restrictive alternative measure test does point towards the importation or you know, towards the use of the WTO necessity test. But how would it actually play out in context of investment treaties is something that 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 needs to be seen. Uh, there was a case involving uh, India, uh, a case known as Devas versus India, where India did uh, uh, argue for necessary 
uh, and there the tribunal did evolve. Uh, I'll, I'll not say the exact WTO version of necessary, but a slightly nuanced version of WTO's necessity test, borrowing more from the continental casualty uh, tribunal's approach. So yeah, it does indicate towards WTO's necessity test, but how would it actually play out will have to be seen based on the interpretation by arbitral tribunals. Just in terms of the timeline of, of the model, were the, do you know whether the Devas case or the Deutsche Telekom cases were, were in the pipeline at the time that the, uh, the model was being revised? Would they have had any impact on the decision to focus on that particular aspect? Yes, I mean, they, they were in the pipeline when the model was being, was being, uh, was being redrafted. So, uh, especially on the question of security interest, because India, India argued the security interest exception in both these cases. Uh, and especially on the issue of security exception, I think they did have a, they did have an impact. Uh, and India has a self-judging security exception in its model bit, but that's not very different from what we find in several other bits, which also have security, you know, self self-judging security exceptions. Pravesh, while I have you talking about the the model, um, the model was designed to address Indian domestic concerns about. The regime. To what extent do you think that India has had the ambition to promote its its new model as setting new international standards or new international norms? You mentioned that to this to this point, the uptake from counterparties has has been pretty pretty slim. Um, is it an ambition to actually shape the the regime, or is it to get those agreements that from parties that are willing to accept it uh, on India's terms? Yeah, I think uh, as of now, the ambition is to convince the countries with whom India already had the BIT to to agree for a new BIT based on the model. Uh, that's the that's the immediate ambition, as I understand. And India has been trying hard to convince especially the EU uh, on this matter. I mean, the EU India FTA, which has been under negotiation for a very long time, uh, has, has again sort of, you know, there's some action happening there. Uh, so India is trying to convince uh, EU members, for example, that, you know, to accept the Indian model bit. But whether India has any grand sort of ambition to set this as an international rulemaking benchmark, I'm not very sure on that front. Uh, uh, you know, generally speaking, within the government uh, today, bits are not a very sort of popular topic. Uh, and, you know, the, the moment you mention bits, they, they throw Vodafone and, you know, Kane Energy and all the, all the cases that India has lost and decide that, you know, this has been disastrous for India as a whole. Uh, so I don't think that India has any such grand ambition of having this as the international rule making benchmark. But yeah, they do want to convince other countries to adopt the Indian model. But I, I, I have doubts, especially vis-a-vis -vis major players, whether they would accept the Indian model. And, and just lastly, I mean, in terms of India's decision to withdraw from the RCEP negotiations, as I understand it, that was not driven particularly by the investment chapter, but please correct me if I'm wrong. But if that's the case, is that a situation in which India might have been willing to accept an investment chapter in which... ISDS might have uh, come through, or at least with substantive provisions that are quite different from those contained in the India model. Yeah, so I mean, India walking out of RCEP was not because of investment chapter. I mean, I think India would have been fine with the investment chapter that we have in RCEP, uh, you know, plus and minus from the model to some extent. But India's, India's main concern was about cheap dairy imports, you know, and, 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 and cheap other imports coming from other countries, especially from China. Uh, and this was largely because of, you know, domestic protectionism. I mean, you know, it's very difficult to make sense of India's economic trajectory in the last five to six years. Uh, it's kind of sort of has changed quite a bit. So initially, when the new government came in in 2014, it was expected that it, it's, you know, it, it's right wing. And therefore, it would be right wing on, 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 on the economic front as well. But it has turned out to be right wing only on the political and social front, not so much on the economic front. Uh, and on the economic front, it has turned out to be pretty inward looking. 
especially uh, since the start of the pandemic when india has openly declared self reliance as you know one of the important policy goals and and within that framework uh, i don't see india uh, signing ftas either you know joining rcep or even other ftas because you know unless until you offer something to other countries why would anybody be interested in signing the fta with you uh, at the end of the day it is about market access uh so 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 with rcep it was not so much about investment but it was more about you know uh, cheaper goods flooding indian markets and causing damage to the indian industry thank you prabash sticking with rcep for a moment charlie i i wonder if i can ask you um the decision not or to the decision to defer a decision uh, with respect to ISDS um, in the investment chapter in, in RCEP. Um, do you have a sense at, at all whether we're going to see ISDS in RCEP? Um, or is this going to be like the Australia-US FTA where, where we have rules but just state-to-state -state mechanisms that may be very unlikely to ever get used? Um, and if we do, is, is this an example of for ASEAN and its partners um, acting as rule breakers in the sense that I was describing earlier of shifting a paradigm away from investor initiated uh, enforcement of rights? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, <laughs> in, my, in my own view, um, an ISDS chapter in RCEP is, is difficult to achieve. Um, because, you know, going back to my analogy earlier about too many cooks, you know, um, there are many views with regard to, um, ISDS, uh, in RCEP, you know, and, and the views, frankly, they are quite wide ranging and they are, you know, they're, they are, they are firm views about these things. Um, so it, it will take, uh, I mean, if, if successful, it will take some time and, and some convincing um, because, you know, as I think the, the overall picture has been highlighted today, states who have been subject to lawsuits, um, you know, they, they are quite uh, careful about committing to, to new obligations on, on ISDS. And there are those states who, who do like ISDS as, as a general, you know, as a general concept. Um, so I, I think it will need some, need some talking on. Thanks. I mean, I guess that one of the comes back to the question of leadership on, on norms and negotiations as well, whether there is a, a key demandeur for ISDS in RCEP and whether whichever state that might be or states has either the inclination or the capacity to drive that through. Um, I mean, I imagine after the, after the horse is out of the barn and the, the door has been closed and then you say, well, we'll talk about whether or not we should let the horse out of the barn. It's a little late. Um, so now that the agreement has been finalized, um, this is just kind of a rump subject for negotiation, which you know, obviously, frames the issue more different, differently than it would have been if it was still part of the entire context and negotiation of the complete FTA. Um, yeah, and sorry, sorry, Jen, just to add on that also, you know, positions on ISDS can shift quite uh, promptly, um, depending on, on the <laughs> domestic situation of, of each country, you know, so, so it's not, uh, it's not something that's a set in stone for for any party, I think. So it's quite something that's quite fluid. Heng, if I can ask you, um, uh, President Xi had mentioned at some point the possibility of, uh, of China considering joining CPTPP. Um, we know, of course, that you're, as Stephanie mentioned, the United Kingdom, um, a very notable Pacific Asian state, has uh, made an application to join. Um, do you see the possibility of uh, China joining as, as, a, as a real possibility? Um, I think this is a great question. Um, 
it's been, I would say yes, and, uh, yes, but it's also a lot of uncertainties and challenges. On one hand, you can understand that, you know, um, China until very recently, uh, like RCP, does not have FTAs with major economy, um, particularly major, uh, you know, trading partners, thinking about the US, thinking about the EU, you know, thinking about Japan. Uh, Japan nowadays is being better. It's very good for China because China uh, becomes a, uh, you know, uh, China, Japan signs the RC, RCP. Uh, and also the geopolitical dynamics means that China also needs those kind of external engagement, you know, for investment to boost the economy, economic developments, given a lot of challenges, including the aging uh, population and also tension with the U.S. Uh, there are legal, economic, and also geoeconomic implications in that regard. So there are incentives explain why China wants to, you know, at least indicate the willingness to consider joining the TPTB. Another side, is that you know the implementation the, the WTO sorry the, RC, uh, the TPP rules are, are very uh, demanding. Uh, if you look at those rules regarding SOEs, you know, and also competition data flow, I think actually it's a huge gap between what is the TPP rules with a vis the China's position in regard to thinking about data localization with a vis data free flow, you know, SOEs because China is a Beijing consensus state led economy. So I will see that's being, and also uh, as we see in the WT discussion or uh, debates, the key is that uh, to what extent the rules will be implemented and enforced, because that also depends on China's uh, political willingness to do so. And, you know, WT already attract a lot of debates in that regard, you know, about compliance with WT rules and so on and so forth. So I think that's, uh, uh, I think it's understandable or it's, uh, that China wants to join the TPP but another side, there are a lot of challenges in that regard, and those remain to be seen. And they, are, they need a lot of changes. And that substantially, I just want to end saying that you know, I propose that we can look at trade agreements by breadth, you know, their depths and their uh, intensity in terms of how it was in, uh, implemented. China's previous practice are narrow generally, you know, the breadth is pretty narrow, double till based uh, rules in general. And also uh, the depths are shallow because of their full-on WTO. And the strength of the trade agreements are also pretty weak because it's not really utilized this resettlement system even under present Australia-China tension. Um, if you look at TPP, it's a total different story. You know, the breadth is much broader, the depth is much deeper, and the intensity of, of the rules are much higher on uh, enforcement of these rules. So I have a paper on that, uh, how to understand trade agreements on the international lawyer. So they explain more about that. So I will stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hang. And, and a follow-up actually on that though. Um, it, it's, it's impossible not to um, think of President Xi's in indication about CPTPP outside of the context of US-China uh, relations. Um, just as the, the CHI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment with the EU, is impossible really to, to assess, I think, without, again, thinking about U.S.-China relations and EU-China relate EU-U.S. relations, rather, um, in the same breath. An odd circumstance, in a sense, because the United States really retrenched from pursuing new agreements during the Trump administration, and yet it seems to have spurned, uh, spurred on a number of agreements um, by China in, in particular. Um, do you see the, the new administration and the possible change in U.S. policy as having impacts on the way in which China is, continues to pursue the policies that it's, it's been pursuing, um, namely with respect to Europe or in the WTO and so forth? Yeah, I think it's basically uh, the... Uh, Trump administration gave a very interesting uh, example. You know, I think that before Trump withdraw from the TPP, there are a lot of debates even within China that China should consider uh, TPP standards. And because, you know, they will have a critical mass, you know, TPP rules will be international rules. So there will be, uh, you know, China have to face that. But after Trump withdraw from the TPP, you know, China feel much less pressure in that regard. Uh, and, and also, you know, um, uh, in terms of the join uh, those kind of new set of rules. Um, 
coming back to the uh, the Biden administration, I will see that you know um, the tension between U.S. and China will not uh, fade away. I mean, because of the you know, no matter what happened between these two nations, uh, there are uh, tension in that regard of you know uh, geopolitically and geoeconomic one because. Uh, China now is no longer what happened in 2001. You know, it's a much mar larger economy and also have such huge impacts in the global arena. Um, down the track, you know, uh, if we look at the US-China, I think that's been uh, probably continuous to a large extent, the, uh, the tension, uh, particularly regarding those kind of high-tech related investment, you know, data, technology, and now also digital currency, those kind of issues, which will be a lot of, uh, I think, uh, Possible tension, uh, and and re regarding EU, um, because I think that uh, we're facing a quite dynamic and challenging period. Because EU, you, you see the uh, the EU China investment agreements uh, CAI, where Akai, you see that actually a lot of issues about social uh, issues uh, and labor and and you know uh, human rights and other issues, and these are very tricky because China, you know, if you look at China's practice in the past, these are issues not really covered even in, uh, you know, in the existing pre, uh, free trade agreements or soft law. Um, so you see a huge gap again, you know, in terms of Western style uh, per, uh, rules vis-a-vis -vis China's uh, style practice, you know. So I think at the end of the day, I think, um, I think that it depends on whether these Western rules will be uploaded, you know, as a new generation of international rules. If that's the case, I think they will make may incentive China, you know, to, you know, lean more towards those kind of uh, uh, rules. You know, TPP may provide one example, as you just mentioned. So that depends on that. It looks like that uh, China, you know, that may China may face those kind of the dynamics and may feel more incentive to do so. Yeah, but we'll see how they will be the play out because there are a lot of uncertainties and in that regard. Well, we're, we're allowed to indulge in a little speculation, I suppose. Um, thank you. Stephanie, you, you wanted to add something on CPTPP in China. Yeah, thank you, uh, Janssen. Just very briefly, because we're at the end, I think, of, of our session, but um, I think um, CPTPP will be interesting also to see how Mexico and Canada will react to a potential request coming from China because they are the main trading partners of the US and of course linked with the US now in the USMCA and in the USMCA so the new NAFTA um, there is this very interesting clause which is called the China clause or uh, unofficially called the China clause and which would require either Canada or Mexico um, to first of all inform the United States that if um, you know there would be a potential negotiation ongoing or intake of China and then and then also the possibility actually of, of, of the US to terminate um, or to go yeah the US and okay so that's that's that would be really um, you know interesting in, 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 in that respect um, well I'd be better short and hand back to you Jensen thank you well, thank you for that, Stephanie. That, that's an excellent point. The, the poison pill that was built into uh, the USMCA by, by the Trump administration and its potential impact on, on China's participation in any treaty making with, with China or Mexico. Um, as Stephanie rightly, rightly points out, we are, we're coming just to the last couple of minutes um, of our seminar. Um, and I'm sorry to uh, our attendees who have put in so many interesting questions that we haven't been able to get to all of them. But let me just with the last uh, two or three minutes that we have, um, turn to each of you for 30 to 60 seconds of uh, any final remarks that, that you might have or thoughts that you might have on the issues we've covered. And, and why don't we start with you, Stephanie, and, and we'll, we'll work our way through as we did at the beginning. Sure. I think to um, come back of, of what I tried to, to, to say that if there is an ASEANization, I think I need to, you know, it's clear that I'm not suggesting that. I had written papers on the Africanization of international investment law because compared to, to Asia, Africa really has some rules uh, written how effective they are we might discuss but that that it what was a region where it was rather easy to find so many you know so many outliers so many innovation um, in in all terms for procedural as well as substantive and and here in in my short 
time that I'm now here in Singapore, uh, it's 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 I think it's anyway impossible um, to 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 get something something close to that. And I think we covered this today. Uh, we see China as the big player going a different way, and so it's that's 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 how I how I see uh, diversity diversity and um, yeah, very interesting anyway. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks very much, Stephanie Heng. Yeah, thank you. I would like to say that actually we see a, a lot of landscape shape difference uh, because for, if you look at China, it's difficult to change hard law like IAAs. Instead, you know, China relying on uh, soft law MOUs, which don't need to go through a treaty ratification. And also on the project practices, you know, project contracts to promote China standards, you know, Chinese uh, law as applicable law, you know, in, in institution regarding arbitration and others. And also, um, and, and also China relies also heavily on new institution developments, you know, like AIB, you know, the multinational, uh, you know, they have a center for uh, international finance and so on and so forth. So we see that actually these are way where China uh, synaptically reshaping the international rules incrementally because once you have a critical mass of people using Chinese standards and practices, they basically become international practice and they are much lower profile with less resistance or uh, uh, roadblocks. So I think that's actually is a quite different paradigm as we see uh, that happen in new areas where China's advantages like you know, the investment, fintech relates to digital currency, relates to investment, finance, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, quite interesting and different uh, scenario we see compared with the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heng. Prabhash, let me turn to you. Yeah, uh, three quick uh, comments. I mean, first, I would like India to change its attitude towards investment treaties and shed its protectionism. Second, I would like India to be part of RCEP, uh, not, not shy away from, from competition and compete with other Asian countries. Uh, and thirdly, I would like India to support the investment facilitation negotiations at the WTO. So in short, uh, I want the government to do everything differently than what it is doing right now. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Prabash. That was pithy. I appreciate that. Um, Charlie, let me turn to you for final remarks. Uh, unfortunately, I can't come to the same conclusions Prabash did. <laughs> um, but um, no, I, I think my, my point is this. Um, the, going back to the Asianization of, of investment law, I think um, it's, it's beginning to happen. I mean, going back to my yes and no, essentially, you know, it's, it's the power of Asia. It's, it's coming through, certainly, at least through to China and India. You know, it, it hasn't quite broken through to the extent that we can definitely say that there, there is a trend that's coming through from, from you know, the, the region. But, uh, you know, it's the, the, the force is, is forcing its way through to, through the, the traditionally the, the Western model of doing things. So, so I think so. But uh, as a concluding about, I think it's very important to, to keep a close eye on this. I think we had a very important crossroads um, on, on investment law. And uh, over the next five years, certainly during the, uh, you know, the reform stage of, uh, of ANSI trial and of the, these newer FTAs that, that are coming through, um, I think it, it's worth watching this space. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie Shakra, Hang Wang, Prabhash Ranjan, Charlie Ganjana, Gunshorn. Um, we are three minutes over time, so there's nothing left for me to do than to thank our audience and bid you a good day. Thank you.